If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Hey, boys. You want to have a mushroom party? <laughs> You want to have a party with me? <laughs> Such a weirdo. <laughs> you try, you try to do the, the the like the accent or whatever. No, it's like the the touch my monkey. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Would you like some mushrooms? I'm, I'm giving him that, uh, but but for mushrooms, dude. So the president of Four Sigmatic, uh, Taro. I'm gonna I'm gonna fuck up his last name. Yeah, you, you Iso are. Kap- Kwapila. I don't know if I said that. Love right. this guy. Anyway. I fucking love the guy. Hung out with he's him. He's so cool. He's super cool. And we partied with him the next day at Dosis. Yeah, he's yeah. a super cool guy. Very, very smart. He's one of those people that you meet where they're so smart that you're like, dang, that's a little too smart. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he, well, especially like, with, whoa. I think it's important to let people know that if you are not interested in mushrooms, this is not the episode for you. Oh. But if you are at all, <laughs> Interested in the science in in mushrooms, I think this the was medicinal an, application. Of yeah, oh, I, lots of information. I mean, it's an information overload. It, it makes you interested in mushrooms, even if you aren't. I'll be honest. No, it was. I mean, because I wasn't that interested before. You guys know that I'm probably the least fan of all the mushrooms. But I, I'm not gonna lie. After listening to him for this episode, I'm on the mushroom train. Yeah, I, yeah, I and I was drinking it last night. So because of that, I think that uh, you, it's important that you listen to this if you're at all interested mm-hmm. in the science behind it. Because I think Sal and him dive really deep and drop some really good knowledge in here. I remember meeting him for the first time. It was at Paleo FX a couple of years ago, and we're walking around, and I see Four Sigmatic, and I told you know I told the boys that I really wanted to work with Four Sigmatic because. <clears throat> I had dived deep into the science of mushrooms and their application and, and how they've been used for thousands of years in many, many cultures and their unique properties. I mean, they have some unique effects in the body. And I say unique because fungi is a whole different class of, of organisms, it's different than plants, is different than animals or whatever. And, and most of us don't get enough fungi in our diet. And I know the oldest living organism on earth is a, is a mushroom. We talk about this in this episode. But it, I was very fascinated with it, but also... You know, you can buy mushroom supplements, how they're grown, where they're grown, um, how the, the, the mushroom, you know, the ingredients are extracted, how they're stored. Like all these things are important things to know. And I knew that Four Sigmatic understood all this and, 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 you know, basically catered to it, right? Yeah. So when I saw Four Sigmatic, the booth, I ran over there. Little did I know the president, it was Taro. He was the one running the booth. I mm-hmm. thought he was just some dude running the booth. So I shake his hand. I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? Love your product. I, you know, I, I host Mind Pump, blah, blah, blah. And then that's how we got you know, kind of hooked up. And so to my surprise, when we sat down to do an interview with Taro, I had no idea what he looked like. He walks in the room and I'm like, you're the fucking dude that I talked to. Yeah. yeah you know, when we first got this, you know, this whole thing set up. So he, he dives d- deep into mushrooms and their effects in the body and how they work. And of course, Four Sigmatic is one of our sponsors. It's one of my favorite uh, sponsors, one of my favorite products. If you go to four, spell it out, F-O-U-R, Sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash Mind Pump and enter the code Mind Pump, uh, you get a discount. You can find Taro on Instagram at I am Taro, so you can see more information on him. But Taro is T-E-R-O. Just T-E-R-O. But I mean, he's also he's also a cool guy. This is somebody I would hang out. Oh, with. we're gonna go uh, foraging with him at some point. That's here. right. I can't wait for that. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd he take us foraging. What do you say? Up in Big Basin area is like one of the best places to go. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's like our backyard. Yeah, yeah. So hope we don't find those. We have uh, a mushroom party. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. <laughs> those scary ones. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, that's it. So without any further ado, here we are. Oh wait a second, dude. One of the things I want. One of the things I definitely want to do uh, before we get into this interview is is a huge thank you. To Tom and Lisa, Bill, you for opening their home. Oh yeah, to us, wow. man. I yeah. mean, amazing that they did that for us. Right. It's uh, you know a, a testament to how important it is uh, to build to build relationships um, in business, especially because here is someone who is you know we met two about two and a half years ago, and since then you know him and I have maintained a really good relationship and communication with each other, and uh, it was something I didn't ask for. He totally offered it up to us. We were coming on the Health Theory Show, anyways, and. We we normally, when we come down to LA, we do multiple shows while we're down here. It makes sense if we're going to fly the whole crew. And for Tom to open up his home 
and say, dude, you guys can record here mm-hmm. all day. And I mean, it was so dope. We're here and he's got, you know, a whole table full of, you know, quest bars and snacks and water and Letting drinks. Letting us use his co- equipment. Oh, yeah. I mean, and he's got his team that is setting us all up. They're and super generous people. Oh, I, yeah. I, I fucking love Tom and Lisa. Dude. Yeah, yeah. So, good yep. people. Big shout out to you guys. Thank you very, very much for letting us use your home. Yep. So without further ado, here we are interviewing Taro, the president of Four Sigmatic. I think we should start from the okay. from the beginning, Taro. What got you into this? Are you, did you found Four Sigmatic? Are you the founder of that company? Yeah. How, what's your background? What made you get into mushrooms? Uh, I'm a 13th generation family farmer and forager out of Finland. Oh, so wow. the answer is lineage. And plus I'm dumb enough to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so a combination of those. And uh, just went, you know, forging for mushrooms growing up with my mom. And then my great grandfather started this environmental school, which is like a mix of Steiner school. I don't know if you're familiar, but the guy who invented basically organic food, organic agriculture and biodynamic farming. And then like uh, Waldorf style schooling, something like basically like a hippie school with an actual curriculum. Mm. Uh, and and this went, is in Finland? Yeah, this is in Finland. And I went through that and then studied chemistry and nutrition and randomly discovered a rare mushroom about 13 years ago. And um, that was only thought to grow in one island in Japan. And I found it in Finland and won this innovation award. And it's kind of like, um, like with anything, like there's not just one tipping point, but there's like multiple steps that you take. Um, now, when you were, when you were doing this with you, when you were foraging, when you were a kid with your mom and stuff, were you really into it then? Or is this something? I was more into berries because they were sweet and they tasted better. So <laughs> wild strawberries, raspberries. I don't know if guys ever had a wild raspberries, no. but they're like the bomb. Huh. Um, some shoot leaves, nettles, stuff like that. But I did like mushrooms in sauces, you know, it was, I was, and mushroom soups I like, but it was like mushrooms to me were as like a mystical group. You know, it was not something that as a kid, I was like as excited as I was to find wild strawberries in the forest. Now you said 13 generations, was this just you're, you're growing them or foraging for them to, for use in culinary purposes or was this medicinal what, what, how did you guys farm all the, because you said there's 13 generations. Yeah, 13 at least that we know of. Finland has only been independent 100 years. So we were like part of Russia and Sweden for a long time. And a lot of the records were burned. So we don't actually really know at least 13 on both of my parents' side. And, uh, you know, it's for survival. Like the time when you're in the 17th century, life is very different than on the 21st century. So the farm has gone through civil wars, multiple <laughs> under Russian ruling. And so like things have changed multiple times, but- survival dude it's just like Mm. that's that's the core of it you could sell stuff you know that's also but there is also a psychedelic mushroom that is less known a lot of people here are focused on a psilocybin psychedelic Mm -hmm. mushroom uh but there's another even more well known but nobody really knows what it is and how to use it is the mushroom on your phone like the emoji the red mushroom with white dots it's called amanita muscaria and the whole story of basically like Santa Claus and Christmas is based around that mushroom. And it's from Finland, from my indigenous people, like Sami people that inherited that land for over 5,000 years, at least. So much longer than Vikings, which is also my heritage. But Vikings came after the Sami people. So oh, you get, wait, so you got to tell wait, me how- Yeah, tell yeah, me that story. <laughs> yeah, tell me how a mushroom yeah. and Santa Claus tie I know they together. just make things up, but I want to know yeah, where the um, origin comes from. It's a long ass story, <laughs> um, but I'll try to like, the cliff notes. Yes. Okay. okay. Cool. So um, Santa Claus is the world's most famous person, arguably, you know, it's like crosses beyond religions and countries. We know about Santa Claus, but rarely think how did Santa Claus story come, you know, the same way as like Easter and a lot of these other traditions, they're actually originally pagan. So the story of Santa Claus, how we look at it today is obviously like a very Coca-Cola S story that was brought to the U S by the Dutch, the Dutch stole it from Germans. And, um, you might have heard St. Nick, St. Yeah, Nicholas, sure, Smith, but it's yeah. actually not from Germany, even though it's like hmm. labeled as German, it's actually from Turkey. So the Germans took it from the Italians. The Italians literally stole the grave of this guy in Turkey who was St. Nicholas. Yeah, so shout St. Nicholas, out to my people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> grave so, robbers. <laughs> so a lot of going on that. And then at that point, the church really used this ancient story as a way of incorporating into their own values. And that's a whole nother rabbit hole there. Mm -hmm. But they originally, the the Turkish combined the story of St. Nick, who actually existed, and with an even older story of this old man Frost, who was a, it was a, 
a Russian Santa Claus, basically still today. If you go to Russia, you don't celebrate Santa Claus. You celebrate this old man, Frost, Des Morris. And they took it from these indigenous people, Sami. And so that's a whole like how it transferred. But what originally was that um, rain, where reindeers originally grow is in this area of like Lapland, which is partly Norway, Sweden, Finland, parts of like Russia. And there these indigenous people live and they, you know, take care of reindeers. And what they also do is they uh, use plant medicine, or in this case, mushrooms, um, ceremonially a few times a year, like almost every indigenous This is culture. how they fly. I see how this yeah. is all coming oh, together. So, <laughs> we're gonna tie, magic. It's a long intro, but I'm going to tie a couple of loops. So a few times, and the two big celebrations, almost every indigenous culture is <clears throat> winter solstice, summer solstice. So in, in, we're in Lapland. In the summer, there's 24 hours of sunlight. There's really no night. Winter, there's very, there's like an hour or two of sunlight. So really when the day is at its longest, that's when you would do magic. And how they would do it is they would use this mushroom, Amanita muscaria, that the shaman had collected during the summer. And it grows under um, the pineal family of trees, which proves the Christmas tree that you see at Rockefeller oh, okay. Center. Mm -hmm. It can grow under it where Christmas presents are sometimes kept under the tree. Uh. And the shaman would put it on the trees because you have to dehydrate it <clears throat> to remove a toxin. It's also a poisonous mushroom. It's psychedelic and poisonous. So we'd put it on tree branches and to dry it, sun dry, because especially um, sunlight removes this toxin, this tip, one typical type of acid in it that gets removed or reduced if it's sun dried. So when the shaman would at one point collect these mushrooms, it would, be a tree full of red mushrooms. And if you used to go back to even the German time story of this, you can see photos with trees with not red ornaments and balls, but actually Amanita muscaria hanging from the tree. Oh, wow. And the star on the top is Polaris. That was very uh, important for the Sami people. The chimney comes from the fact that the Sami people live in these kotas, which is a huge teepee. This is um, that you enter from, an, um, from a kind of narrow entrance but sometimes during the night it snows in and the entrance is covered with snow and there's a fire inside to keep you warm. But in order for the fire to go away, the TP kind of obviously has a um, hole at the top. And if it snows in, you exit and enter through the chimney or the roof. Hang comes Santa Claus here. What? Reindeers flying. Uh, that's a whole nother story, obviously, <laughs> on how they fly. And there's a couple. Then we snuck Jesus in there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. And um, not to spoil the full story, but there's urine involved, drinking urine. Wow. Which is supposed to. This took a dark turn. Yeah. <laughs> very dark turn. But that's how it, one of the ways I removed the poison and out of it. But also. My uncle celebrated that. There's muscimol. There's a compound there that gets emphasized if you rotate urine. And uh, you drink urine, and that's how they say that the the term "get pissed" was originally. Oh shit! Wow, my childhood is alive. I'm so <laughs> glad you shared that. <laughs> that's that's funny. Funny. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of tensions around that, but I think <laughs> we just spoiled someone's day. I, you guys have had such bangers lately. You've had Ben Green for the whole <laughs> check, so you needed an intermission yeah. here. That's you know? a, oh, that that's a great, great story, man. That's, right that's a great. Tell, so, what's this oh, mushroom that you discovered that you won an award for? You had said uh, like a yeah, few it's, minutes it's, ago. It's, so, mushrooms are a kingdom, or fungi, or fungi. There's no right or way to say it. So. There's like a lot of people say, I don't like mushrooms because like I don't like portobello mushrooms or I have they have candida and they their gut health is not aligned. But actually the kingdom of fungi is in immensely like wide and there's so many different types. There's mm. about six times more fungi types than there are plants estimated to be on the world. So That's for every avocado and bell pepper, there's six of each on different oh, wow. mushrooms type. And, but Didn't very know. kind of like before it gets overwhelming, there's two kinds of mushrooms for humans, really like from a, from a functional point of view, there's culinary mushrooms and then there's, there's the functional mushrooms. So for Sigmatic, my company is really focused on functional mushrooms that help support performance or reduce stress or sleep quality or sex drive or cognitive function, whatever. But then there's the whole suite of culinary mushrooms, like morels, like for example, people hunt them for, for their uh, flavor. And uh, if you go to a lot of fancy Michelin star restaurants, they're like specialized. That chanterelle is more like a commonly known morel, but there's also like the truffles of the world, right? And the Japanese have this one mushroom called machutake, and it's like the truffle for the Japanese. It's their like really prestigious mushroom. And taki, by the way, T-A-K-E means mushroom in Japanese. So she taki, my taki, mm. just means she mushroom, thai, uh, my 
mushroom, which all means something else, like a tree or something. And um, and they just love this mushroom, but it's really hard to get. And and basically discovered that it grows also in Finland because the climate in this one island in Hokkaido is similar to where I grew up in one spe- specific part of Finland. And uh, as almost as a joke with my friend, we just entered this innovation contest that is like, wouldn't it be funny if we would sell this to the Japanese for like 5,000 bucks a kilo <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. But it actually became a legit thing. And the, the university, I think, still runs it. So we donated it to a university for because we didn't want to run it. Uh, but I think they still still sell mushrooms to the Japanese. Well, fascinating. So let's talk wow. about the, the, <laughs> the functional side of mushrooms because I know in... In Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Eastern European medicine, mushrooms yeah. have been used for thousands of years. Uh, Western medicine just now is starting to learn about some of the effects of, of mushrooms. Um, years ago, I had a family member who had cancer and I was doing lots of research and I stumbled upon chaga, which uh, in Eastern Europe has been used for a while uh, to combat certain mm-hmm. types of cancer. Let's talk about some of these functional mushrooms and what they do and why they're so special and how people use them around the world. Yeah. So uh, one of the big bummers is that because I have a company and I sell products, I'm like not really in a position where I can give direct like comments about certain functionality. I have to like tiptoe along the lines of FDA, FTC. So sure. like, oh, why, why is that? Explain that. What? So um, basically it's to protect consumers. Um because the F- they want the FDA wants to sell their drugs. They don't want you to sell. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and this is actually the U.S. is the wild, wild west. So, what uh, FDA and FTC allows, it's much more than what you would allow in Canada, Australia, really? or Europe. They're more strict. Okay. But so, basically, to protect consumers, uh, companies are not allowed, or who sell pharmaceuticals, or sell supplements, or sell food, they have to be careful on what they claim that is possible, mm-hmm. which is in you know, high level, a good thing, you know, you don't sure. want to just come out and say, this will make your penis bigger. Right. Right. You know, mm-hmm. like, cause it would sell like, <laughs> yeah, that was the case. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, so you just have to be careful about, and there's all kinds of claims and stuff. Uh, can we talk I, about the studies that have been done? Yeah. So okay. I can tell a little bit about the studies, but I think what is probably more useful, you know, I, I think your audience is pretty smart and they can, you know, Google and go to PubMed and do a lot of their own research, but understand what fungi do in biology is also a good way to look at what they can also possibly do in life, right? So fungi is one of these five or six kingdoms with animals, bacteria, you know, uh, plants. And what they do is they have this intelligence to help other um, kingdoms to operate. So fungi was the first kingdom to come from the sea to the dry land about 2.4 billion years ago. Okay, and they were here well, like estimated about 1.7 billion years before anything else grew on dry land. So they had to eat rocks to survive. And what's similar about fungi and animals is that they cannot produce their own food and they breathe oxygen and expel CO2. So actually animals and fungi used to be part of the same super kingdom. So we share up to 50% of our DNA with fungi, which makes fungi very potentially bioavailable for humans but also very potentially very toxic. So molds in buildings or things that can really, we've been really sensitive to fungal badness and we can really be receptive to fungal goodness. And to the goodness point is like about 40% of all pharmaceuticals are derived from fungi, which is insane. Mm. Penicillin is the one that everybody knows, Mm. but a lot of immunosuppressants on the market, for example, a lot of immune focused things. You talked about cancer and there's immunosuppressants, but that's where a lot of the fungal studies are. And the reason for that is that that's what they do in nature as well. They actually help plants uh, in like trees, for example, tell where there's nutrition. They tell that here's water, here's when they exchange nutrients between trees. So the roots of the trees have this rooting system of mushrooms and they, for example, swap nutrients. Like this tree has this nutrient, this tree has this nutrient and they swap things together and Mm. they tell if there's danger somewhere. So if there's a hostile species or thing on the other side of the forest, they communicate underground called like the wood wipe web and the fungal matter is underground everywhere in this planet. So about 25% of the earth's biomass. So quarter of the earth's biomass is is fungal 
material. How do they I've communicate? That, like, yeah, I've heard that even when you walk like in the forest, like it's it's already like mapping all these. Like, yeah, it yeah, will know steps. that you stepped on it, basically. Yeah. How do they communicate? Is it just through chemical signals? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> actually like one of the things that we don't fully understand, but there's interesting studies how even a slime mold can figure out the the Tokyo metro system smarter than humans can and how they can get themselves out of a maze. You drop them and they'll find a route out of that maze with some sort of intelligence. So we don't really know. We obviously know out of these functional mushrooms, some compounds that are inc- incredibly well studied for certain functions, but the intelligence that the fungal kingdom have is still massively not understood, in, even to the point of like, psychedelic mm-hmm. mushrooms or whatever like we don't we don't really right. know but a lot of people can probably justify that they do something you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what did, how do they do it there's some evidence there's some studies and we can obviously talk about them but like in a in a in an abstract we're just figuring shit out you know mm-hmm. wow. can i curse by the way yeah oh, oh yeah, well, I'm yeah. 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 <laughs> it's they, encouraged they um it's they, encouraged. Yeah. the thing that fascinates me about mushrooms is their their symbiotic relationship that they tend to have with their hosts yep. were, were if you get other types of infections or parasites or whatever, many times they'll, you know, kill you or yep. take you over. Whereas in, in many cases, um, certain species of plants almost require that symbiotic relationship from the mushrooms, which is yeah, very over fascinating. 90% of plants require mushrooms to grow. And you could actually argue that every human being requires mushrooms to grow, you know, mm. be ourselves. Cause, and here's my, uh, <clears throat> guess for the future is that we'll discover in my lifetime, discover a new kingdom that is something between bacteria and fungi. And so they have this relationship even in our gut, but also anywhere else. It's like they have these yeasts, especially like beer and wine and bread and kombucha and all these things require the collaboration between fungi and bacteria. Otherwise you cannot produce certain cheeses. So there is something how they collaborate that we don't fully understand, but they definitely do goodness mm. um, and including in our gut and in mm. our body and in our immune system. One thing I learned a, a while ago that it's obvious when you think about it, but it never occurred to me was that mushrooms are not plants in the sense that like when people say you should eat vegetables every single day, you should have some proteins and some fats every single day. Nobody says you should eat mushrooms every day right. because they, they think if they eat vegetables, that they're getting in, you know, that that's part of that, but it's not, it's totally different. Totally. And I know in a lot of uh, cultures and a lot of uh, like alternative medicines, mushrooms are considered a staple. Like it's something you should also consume on a regular basis. Like essential nutrient almost. Yeah. yeah and that's, uh, that's very fascinating to me. How do they operate within the body when we ingest them? How, or, or, or do they operate differently than other things? Yeah. So a lot of the culinary mushrooms that you'd find in a grocery store, they have things like fibers. They're, they can be prebiotics. So if if you're into the gut health world, you probably tune into the importance of prebiotics that even, it's hard to change your gut biome by having more probiotics unless you, unless you just went through like an antibiotic something. Mm-hmm. But using prebiotics is often a way to improve gut biome and mushrooms are one of those sources. They can contain proteins. Um, some of them actually have a pretty good protein profile. I think shiitake. I'm not saying that that would be a single source of protein or that, but like you could probably replace a meal a day or Mm -hmm. a few meals a week by using a different form of a protein source. They have B vitamins um, pretty widely depending on the mushroom, but there's a, some have more B3, 6, you know, but they are a great source of B vitamins and vitamin D, one of the only plant-based sources of vitamin D. So for example, where the Sami people live, they get a very limited amount of sunlight. So they would use mushrooms as a way of getting vitamin D throughout the winter for like seasonal depression and stuff. So that's kind of like the <clears throat> macro and micronutrient profile of m- mushrooms can offer a very like clean source of carbohydrates. And But then we get to the intelligence part. And one of the most studied compounds is a form of polysaccharide. So you know, many sugars. Um, but as you know, that sugars come in many forms and these polysuchers are the ones that release the slowest. And especially this type of patidi klugans that you can get in small amounts from let, let's say oats, but they're one of the most studied compounds in human health period. And they're incredibly abundant in these type of mushrooms. And, and what they're studied for is certain type of immunomodulation, the ability to modulate your immune system 
too directionally. So when your immune system is low, you normally tend to take immunostimulants like let's say garlic or echinea or something like that. But if you overly stimulate your immune system and your immune system is hyperactive, then you get into troubles like allergic reactions and the autoimmune stuff where your body is attacking your even healthy cells because mm -hmm. they're confused. So then you take immunosuppressants to do that. But what mushrooms and these beta glucans seem to be able to do is this modulation of two directionally, um, it, they're like a boot camp for the immune system. So that's what these beta glucans do. There's a lot of studies, obviously, just because purely out of funding for um, for blood sugar uh, type of things and, and uh, like heart health and things like antioxidants. Mm -hmm. There's certain very good antioxidants in mushrooms from anything from glutathione to melanin to... So there's like a lot of antioxidant focused studies out there just because those are where the funding is available. And not to say that those are the only ways where you can use mushrooms for, mm -hmm. but. Now I yeah. read that mushrooms, uh, you probably want to find organic ones as often as possible because they tend to absorb pesticides or herbicides. Yeah, they're and kind of, they're kind of gnarly in a way that to the, your symbiotic point, actually fungi are parasites. And the word parasite is a really bad word in our society. If some right. a human being, he's such a parasite, right? right, mm -hmm. right, right. But what basically means in nature is that they will use another form of living being for their benefit. And that's what basically we all do. We eat food for our benefit, right? Sure. And just like how it helps the overall society, it, whole ecosystem is like, how much are they like symbiotic, for example? So there's a scale and what, mushrooms do is that they are the cleaners of the forest and cleaners of the nature. So they have this ability that seems to be that almost nothing else has the ability in nature to break out both organic and inorganic matter. So let's talk about that. Organic matter is like if you die and they put you in the graveyard, mushrooms will come and decompose your body. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they can also break down inorganic matter that doesn't really necessarily belong in nature in that form. So something that was organic was shape-shifted into something that was inorganic, and now it's in nature. Case example, oil, like diesel and oyster mushroom that is commonly available in grocery stores could potentially help clean oil from nature. And there's, um, they found a mushroom three, four years ago in the Amazon that eats plastic. Whoa, oh, wow. Yeah, and then you can eat it, That's actually. So cool. <laughs> and it's so, safe yeah. to eat. So it eats the plastic and you can eat it and you're all good. Yeah. And then there's That's like certain chemical warfare weapons like VX and Soma that are potentially the most gnarly things human race has ever created. Mm. And they can just go out and munch it. They're they like munch checks and balance. For sure. And they love like eat radiation. You can find them in like nuclear <laughs> radiation. Wow. That's how a superhero gets badass. born or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But those cases, if they've cleaned the nature, you don't want to consume those ones. So, sure. so they are, they accumulate and hyper accumulate toxins from the forest. So that's why you kind of have to know where your mushrooms come from. And it's the same thing with like, when we talk about plants, a lot of plants, you don't have to always worry if they're organic or not, right? Because they're lower in the food chain. Sure. Same with small fish versus big fish. If you eat small fish, there's less likelihood of toxins accumulated versus you go to tuna, you kind of have to know where your tuna comes from, a salmon, right? Because they've eaten so much during that food chain. So mushrooms, even though they're small and seemingly should be lower in the food chain like vegetables, uh, we talked about the similarity with them and, and animals they actually are kind of further in the food chain. So you have to be more quality conscious with fungal things than you have to be with vegetables. So. That's interesting. I've never heard anyone say that before. Have mm. you ever heard anyone say that before? Yeah, yeah. No, I was reading about uh, like how you want to get organic mushrooms for sure because they tend to absorb whatever's around them and they can accumulate those things. No, just as far as the hierarchy of like how you should be more cautious about it. If oh, it's, for sure. Yeah, if yeah it's like for a, sure. It's a bigger animal. Yeah, like sardines a, versus like swordfish. You're going to have way more mercury in, in swordfish correct. than you would. And also like how often you consume it, obviously. If you have a staple food that you eat every day, you want to be more mindful of that. Mm. But as a rule of thumb, I think when you look at purity in your diet in general, you want to you want to really focus on stuff that you consume a lot or stuff that is further in the mm. food chain or things that are concentrated goodness or badness. I think nothing is more true than fat. Animal fat is like, you really want to know where your animal fat comes from because it's concentrated of amazingness or concentrated of not amazing. That's right. So, That's like, right. so like you really, this, so, but just in the case of mushrooms, they're further in the food chain, even though they seem small and tiny and little things, you know? 
but they have consumed something else because they had to eat to live versus plants use photosynthesis to create, generate energy and to grow. Animals and fungi need something to munch on. Mm. Oh, that's there, interesting. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't the, the largest living organism on, on Earth a mushroom? Yeah, it's in it's in Oregon. It's it's like underground. It's and underground. There's a national forest growing on top of it. So this is kind of a crazy thing. Nobody ever believes it. Um, it's it's the hum humongous fungus, but it's between two to four thousand years old. So it's the oldest living organism on the planet Earth right now, as we know it. And it's about size of 20,000 basketball courts. Holy shit. <laughs> of one mushroom. And this is the crazy part. If you think of your skin, depending how you classify your skin, but like you have three or seven layers, I think, at least three, right? It has one, it has one layer. And it has survived two to 4,000 years. Wow. And it has been attacked by all kinds of species and whatever. And it has survived. So think of the immune system of this living being. Incredible. To have to live to two. So the longevity and the immune system and the protection mechanism that this massive mushroom, one cell level thick in the honey mushroom family mm. can survive that long. And it eats the national park a few times. I can't remember the exact time period, but it eats all through, it just eats trees. What? It keeps eating. <laughs> so now it's all underground though. Because so, right now I'm envisioning this massive mushroom like from yeah, the Smurfs, it's, but it doesn't look like It's become so big. It will pop fruiting bodies. So it, maybe that's also a good thing to talk about. Mushrooms, we've talked now that they're underground, right? That is like the rooting system of mushrooms, sometimes known mycelium or hyphae. It's basically the, there's this rooting system and that's most of mushrooms out there. But then what we actually eat is called the fruiting body. So that's the classic mushroom shape. That's the, even if you go to a grocery store, you mm. never get mycelium. You get the- The, the, the cap. The, the, the cap is part of the fruiting body. There's mm. a stem, sure. a cap, but then there's so many different types of mushrooms that don't have a stem and a cap. So, but generally speaking, the classic mushroom shape, <clears throat> and that's what mammals consume. So be it reindeers consume this poisonous psychedelic mushroom and they trip around, which is, happens you can google bbc reindeers i'm and you're going to see a video of, and uh anyway animals Excellent. love that's to trip cool, on that's that a cool fact. <laughs> and uh All animals like to trip yeah, yeah. it's true um or we don't know what's the experience of the reindeer i have just have to disclaim that seems like they're having a fun time but we don't really <laughs> it's hard to be the reindeer and know what they're actually experiencing but they're drawn to it <laughs> they come back for it so <laughs> it's something that they must enjoy <laughs> and um so that is the fruiting body. And then there's spores and they're in the air. So as we're speaking, we're breathing in mushroom spores. Spores are everywhere, they're in the air and they're kind of a dormant for a while. And then 20, 30 years later, they will create more mycelium that will create a fruiting body that will create a spores. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the cycle of life in the eyes of a fungi mm -hmm. or fungi. And um, yeah, and the most of it's underground and it's invisible, but it, you sometimes find these fruiting the bodies also in this humongous fungus can create fruiting bodies. So, but most of the mass is underground. Do we, do we know like a, uh, like a recommended dose of each type of mushroom that probably we should consume? Do you have any idea of like, do you have a regimen yourself? Like I make sure I have this much chaga ratio. I mean, how do you? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Cause like, as you guys know, in health and wellness, it's not just the, how much you know, or how much you've consumed. It's more like, what can you put in practice and what can you have compliance with? Right. The problem when we talk about a kingdom, there's such a diversity of things. Like, is like, is the amount of avocado you should consume every day the same amount as how much sweet potato can you consume mm. versus, or we can go even stronger, how much pot you can consume. They're all plants, right? right. But the amount of marijuana that you can consume versus the amount of potatoes you can consume is not the same thing. Way more so, pot than potatoes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> potatoes upset my stomach. Big yeah. tolerance. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically it's it's so dependable on, and the crazy part is that because they're these extra fields that can grow anywhere, they build this mechanism to protect themselves. And they especially have this chitin structure and chitin is very hard, almost impossible for humans to break down chitin you would find in the shell of a lobster, for example. So okay. you can't eat the shell of a lobster, same way you can't eat mushrooms raw. So you have to cook them. So to prepare mushrooms, you need fats and heat. Most commonly mushrooms are sauteed in butter mm -hmm. or they put in a soup. And that's how you unlock their nutritional powers. You can also cook them in like bone broth. That's called a decoction. That's probably the most potent way of consuming mushrooms. Mm. 
So there's like preparation. When the same way as you do bone broth, you can cook it for a couple hours or you can cook it for days, right? Mm -hmm. So like how strong is the bone broth or how strong is anything that you extract coffee, mm. you extract coffee mm -hmm. or tea, like do you steep the tea for 15 seconds mm. or multiple minutes. So that's a difference. Yeah. So mushrooms are the same. Um, most products on the market, when you talk about functional mushrooms are extracts. I wouldn't even recommend buying, if you're listening to this, I wouldn't even recommend buying nothing but extracts if you're not familiar with the extraction process required. And in those extracts, there's a huge scale and quality. What I would say is first get stuff that is organic stuff that is actual fruiting body. So grown in, in its natural, it's you using the right part of, of the mushroom. And then I recommend taking anything from 500 to 1500 milligrams a day. But again, I'm talking very depends. general. Of course it depends. Yeah. depends. And how big you are, how sensitive you mm -hmm. are. Some people can handle less, mm -hmm. some can handle more. Mm -hmm. Um, is it, is it common in, in the, the mushroom space to for people and supplement companies to pixie dust it or like they do with other supplements? Where Hell they, yeah. Okay. Hell yeah. I mean, dude, it's, it's, <laughs> it happens with anything, right? Right. right. So, the money's well, this is, right? this is why I liked your, your, your company. I, we, I met you at Paleo FX a couple of years ago yeah. and I saw your, your stand and I'm like, I got to talk to these guys because you know, the first time I ever heard of or using mushrooms in for athletic performance or for health, well, I'd heard about it before. I have an uncle who does Chinese medicine, but I forgot what year it was, but the Chinese swim team in the Olympics was killing everybody. And then they attributed their success to using cordyceps, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting mushroom, by the way. It grows in caterpillars, like kills them and yeah. grows out of their body. So I had studied the cordyceps and I had bought some products and- the difference, and I don't remember what the brands were, but some of them did nothing and others, I could clearly feel like, oh, this is actually giving me some stamina when I'm doing, at the time I was training in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And then you learn about like, okay, you need to be able to extract the, the what's gonna work in your body. You can't just take it and then expect your, your body to unlock the nutrients or the compounds in it, they're gonna have an effect. And I know with Four Sigmatic, you guys have this dual extraction process, which is, trying to maximize the the effects of whatever's in there. How does that work? Yeah, so, um, I mean, like, let's take first a step back in general in any supplement, food product, whatever market, there's definitely like multiple factors, points of, of differentiation, points of quality. So first of all, obviously, like, what genus are you taking? Like, are you taking, so genus is like the, the what exact type of like, let's say, um, there's many types of tomatoes or there's many types of potato, like let or even, and many breeds of dogs or something mm -hmm. like that. So, so not all of them are the same. So if you think of, okay, actually dogs, that's a horrible example. Sarah, <laughs> Cause, okay? Cause they're all, they the all dogs. have the same Latin name, but <laughs> let's for the sake, forget what I just said, but let's assume that you look at a dog that is like a Husky versus a Chihuahua. Yeah. They're like, they're different, right? They're built differently. So same can be applied to mushrooms. Some varieties are stronger than others. Then how it's grown. Is it grown in wild in Siberia or in a laboratory in in east side of LA or something. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, that's a difference. And then how it was harvested and collected. Was it harvested at a peak period? Was it harvested when it was too young or too old? How it was dried and processed? The extraction is what really is the mushroom, in the case of with mushrooms, a huge differentiator because that's where you unlock its bioavailability. Because you could have a great starting point, but you can F it up totally by not extracting it or extracting incorrectly. And mushrooms, I mentioned that they love heat and fats or lipids. They have two kinds of really groups of active compounds, water soluble and non-water soluble. Water soluble compounds are the things that help with your immune system and gut health. So most, almost all top mushrooms are good for your gut health and your, if, if your immunity. And they are antiviral, antibacterial, yada, yada, yada. But then the other part is these non-water soluble, often fat soluble compounds that are more adaptogenic, which is a very buzzy word right now, mm -hmm. but- Helps your body deal with stress. Correct, in different ways. So in case of cordyceps, there is like very specific compounds mm -hmm. that can help with, for example, ATP production in a cellular level, or VO2 max was improved in the case of like the Chinese endurance athletes, their ability to take oxygen in your lungs improved. 
And these are very quantifiable things. Other things could happen in your body, but VO2 max, we can measure pretty mm -hmm. easily. And it works. I mean, I, I, I always can tell a difference when I take cordyceps before. Now, if I'm doing a heavy strength training, you know, one to three reps, long rest, I don't know it's a huge difference, but when my workouts speed up and I need yep. more stamina or they're longer, for sure, I notice a difference. And I noticed a difference when I did jujitsu. In fact, half my, the, the class I used to take would take cordyceps because they would notice a difference. Well, yeah, definitely. If you have any aerobic exercise, um, I would say cordyceps is probably the best of the functional mushrooms because it really helps with the ability to, you know, move oxygen in your body. And that's huge for, if you are more in the anaerobic type of exercise, I would really look into mushroom called lion's mane that protects. It's usually used as a nootropic, like the, a smart drug. I was just going to say, I didn't know that. Okay. So but tell me about you this. have to understand is like a lot of anaerobic exercise, actually the nervous system recovery is huge. So oh, let's take a, a case of example of runners. Like if you're, if you're not a sprinter and you go at the track and you do high intensity exercises or something like that, and you do, let's say, like people think like 100 meter dash or 60 meter dash is like an easy workout. Like you go and if you're not used to it and you don't know what you're doing, you could be for two, three weeks, you're sore because sure. you overstimulate your nervous system. And nervous system recovery takes a lot more longer than recovery of, for example, muscle tissue. We talk so, about this all the time. Like DOMS, like that's not really a problem. Like that's not your mm -hmm. problem. So like how... And in one single exercise in one of those, if you really push your nervous system, you can achieve a lot of damage. Well, mo so, most people don't realize like if you want to be really, really strong, you, you get strong muscles, but have a powerful CNS. That's going to yeah. give you, this is why Olympic lifters, you know, 150 pound uh, Olympic lifters can lift more than a 230 pound bodybuilders or CNS that's able to generate, you know, tremendous amounts of force. And for people listening right now, You've experienced this if you've ever drank coffee or had caffeine before a workout. That extra strength you get from the, from the caffeine mm -hmm. isn't because your muscles got bigger. It was because your CNS was able to fire more effectively. Mm -hmm. Totally. And then, and generally what mushrooms I mentioned that they're good for immune system, which is one of the least sexy topics in health. I think it's probably the third least, the third most underrated part about health. I think number one is eye health totally total tangent by the way apologies but like how much we stare computers and phones like nobody's really focused on eye health i think it's just going to blow up in the next 20 30 mm -hmm. years oh, of different antioxidants and color pigments that protect your eyes of the damage that we're putting in it's a totally new frontier that we'd have mm -hmm. no clue what's going to happen mm -hmm. when you grow up as a kid staring at ipads and how will that impact your Didn't even think of that um second i think that is beyond underrated i think is um is basically like your sleep quality, which sounds so fundamental, but like most people react to poor sleep with more energy products. Mm -hmm. And we see that all the time. Whenever we make a, at Four Sigma, if we make a product that like tries to lower stress or sleep deeper, like people don't like get that. If you make something for the brain and energy, people want that usually. Mm -hmm. But the immune system is so related to like our skin quality and our ability to recover and our gut health. And when you've finished a workout, your immune system is actually kind of, Fucked, you know, it's mm -hmm. like temporarily you could get sick really easily. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever, you know, run a marathon or you do like a big CrossFit <clears throat> tournament, whatever you do and you push you to this, the next level, it's very easy to get sick, like very easy. So I think a lot of like really smart post-workout stuff, um, recovery stuff would include something that helps the immune system be rebuild. You can achieve that in easy ways, like with really nutrient-dense berries, but you'd also use things like these functional mushrooms and a small amount in your post-workout shake to kind of rebuild your immune system and, and speed up the recovery there as well. It is part of the immune system's job along with the central nervous system. In fact, I just read an article that the central nervous system um, and parts of your, your body fat even uh, react to inflammation to help, mm -hmm. uh, to, to help manage it. And inflammation is necessary. If it goes out of control, of course, we know what that's like. And if it's too low, then you can start to deteriorate and, and you, cause problems. You just literally described how the immune system works, basically mm. to, to inflammation. Yeah, you need you need that. And so having a healthy immune system for athletes, it's not just about not getting sick. It's also about how well you recover and how well your body adapts, which is what you want. You want to build muscle, you want to burn body fat, you want to get faster, stronger, whatever. Yeah. The immune system plays a major role in that. But you know, back to lion's mane. So lion's mane 
help strengthen the, the central nervous system or does it stimulate the central nervous system? Well, there's a specific part of the nervous system or actually part is the nerve growth factors. Are you guys from, have you heard? Like BDNF right? and? No, it's actually NGF. Okay. It's, but basically um, one of the compounds in lion's mane has the ability to penetrate the blood brain barrier, which is kind of rare. Only like usually like glycos and certain like essential nutrients can penetrate basically your body from your brain. And we need to talk about that for a second, just for the listeners. So the yeah. blood brain, bar bra brain barrier exists to protect your brain from potential toxins, toxins and, and pathogens. Yeah. Correct. And one of the problems with, and, and that's great, but then getting things to the brain, if you want to take a medication, very, very challenging. Very hard. Very Almost, challenging. I, I mean, there's just a handful of things that can do that. It's literally, and that. it's a good thing, again, like, because it's a way to protect our body, mm -hmm. even if we're super, super, super sick. Like, that's another way of, like, how we can maintain the brain to the to the final hour, in a way. Right. But what lion's mane does have the ability is to penetrate that. And there's another compound there that can help rejuvenate these nerve growth factors. And nerve growth factors kind of became big by this Italian female um scientist and she was actually i think the oldest person to ever win the nobel prize on science and she served in the italian government until the day she died which was like 103 years old wow what? but basically these syn okay. synapses that fire in our brain so like how the nervous systems basically connect with each other those nerve growth factors are an essential part of how well that nervous central nervous system is firing and this lion's mane seems to have ability to help with that. So obviously more research is needed. Um, so I, I do I do lion's mane with um, caffeine. And now it makes perfect sense as to why that would, because when I take lion's mane with caffeine, I'm fire. Yeah. I'm literally on fire. And sometimes I'll do it before a podcast and these guys can't get me to shut up. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, a, it's an excellent combination. Um, what about some of the other products? Like we talked a little bit about cordyceps, uh, chaga. Chaga, from my experience, um, immunomodulator, it's an adaptogen. I know it's got some anti-cancer properties. What are some of the, the traditional uses of chaga in, in medicine? Well, the traditional use is the, the name chaga comes from Russian language, and that's who, who made it popular. It grows anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, so it grows in the U.S., Canada, cold climates, and birch trees, but... It became famous to um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which is a Nobel winning yes. law, uh, author. Um, talked a lot about like kulaks and the concentration camps yeah, in Russia. Didn't he write the uh, was it the Gulag Archipelago or the right. something the, like that? The, Ar yeah, I have his book actually. I'm about to read it. It's yeah, you said that. Um, and but the, he wrote a book called Cancer Ward and talks about in that book using chaga and that kind of gave it popularity in, in the West a little bit as well. Um, but chaga traditional uses for gut health and cancer that I cannot say our product helps with those things, but, right. but that's the tradition. That's what use. they use it for. Yeah. What it's we know about it. Yeah. yeah. That what we know about it is incredibly high amounts of antioxidants. And I mean, God, the internet loves to debate, which is the number one source of antioxidants, but <laughs> yeah. chaga is definitely somewhere out there. Um, like a cup of dual extracted wild chaga would equal to like 30 pounds of carrots in antioxidants. Mm. Not all antioxidants do the same thing though. Uh, but one of the things that is very hot, two things that are very high in, in chaga is the super oxase dismutase, the SOD. Mm. And that's for an athlete, something definitely, if you are an athlete, you want to work out do two a days or be more active, I would really look into the research of SOD. Um, the other one is melanin. And we know how that kind of creates the color pigment on our skin. Melanin is an antioxidant. So um, if you want to protect your skin, if you're a lot exposed to a lot of sun or something skin related, I would look into uh, maybe supplementing your lifestyle and diet with chaga or mm -hmm. so a natural source of melanin. Yeah, one thing I also found fascinating about some of these mushrooms is, and because again, I'm in the in the fitness industry, which is ten, tends to be geared around fat loss and muscle building. Yeah, was some of the I've seen studies that show that some of these mushrooms will raise testosterone levels in men who have depressed testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to do that with normal testosterone, like so people who are healthy, but when people tend to have depressed or hormones that seem to be out of balance. Some literature shows that it may be one of those things that helps balance it out. And I think that's kind of a hallmark of an adaptogen. 
Yes. So technically, in order to now adaptogens, everything is adaptogen today. Right. But um, in theory, the original research on adaptogens kind of you need three things to qualify as a real adaptogen. One is that it's first of all safe and non habit forming. So if it it's, if it can form you an addiction or a habit, or if it has toxic capabilities, technically you cannot be. I mean, anything is toxic at a, a at a bigger amount, but um, you should have to be safe and non habit forming. The second is that it needs to be non specific, which is always hard to research <laughs> and study because it's non specific. But basically means that it has multiple functions or this modulation ability to modulate something, so it's two directional, but. It can work multiple body parts. So you could maybe maybe the work effects are on the endocrine system, and maybe they're in the central nervous system. Maybe they're in the blood circulation or the ability to produce like ATP production. Like there's multiple touch points where adaptogens could, you know, land. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's obviously like hard from a scientific point of view to really, you know, narrow down. But that's kind of how they work, and. Um, and in this case, for example, I think it's really important to not fully buy into the hype of adaptogens, but acknowledge that they are, and there are things that can do that, and you can use them in a in a certain way. And we don't fully know how they work, but if you use the right quality, I think you believe that you should feel the effects. So you should. I feel like you should just trust that. The feeling. The feeling more than the fact of like we're still. For example, in the case of testosterone is obviously that's a marker you can measure, but I feel like sometimes hormones get misunderstood. Like we think that like, oh, our testosterone is low and the problem is testosterone, but like maybe testosterone is low in the body because the body's trying to buffer something else. Right. You're stressed out, didn't sleep very Correct. well. Correct. So it's like, it's a safe buffer and it's, it's, it's actually there to protect you and you should figure out why has it been pushed down? Sure. You can elevate it. And, but if you use something synthetic, but it seems to be that these mushrooms have this intelligence of modulating, but not stimulating or suppressing, mm. but like mm. they modulate. So mm. because this is your field of expertise, do you study like all mushrooms, besides, you know, like uh, like no, even the psychedelic in, ones? Yeah, I, I mean, psychedelics, yeah, but like, no, it's impossible. Like, unfortunately, like uh, even if, even if you are a mycologist, like you would choose few types of mushroom families that you focus on. And probably even there you would focus on a specific, like for example, enzymes that are, you know, in the protein family, but a lot of them are derived from certain like fungi. And you would just focus on few types of enzymes that can be used in a laundry detergent. And your life, mm. whole, whole life is dedicated on this <laughs> wow. family of, of wow. certain lipase that can remove oil stains from mm-hmm. your shirt when you wash it. Because like stuff like that, right? Mm. And so now washing machines are more energy efficient. So they use different types mm. and we need new enzymes and you could dedicate your whole life on it. I can't do that. Like mm. I'm just really focused on- What made you do Four, four Sigmatic? What made you start a company like that? Um, I mean, um, there's, I just, I struggle answering that question because it's a lifestyle. You mm. know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's not like one day I woke up and then, an apple fell on my head and I was like, it's like something that is within me, you know? It's like trying to explain God to someone if you just feel it kind of like it's kind of hard. Did you, I mean, did you see the writing on the wall? I mean, you've already a couple times said some things about what you think is going to happen in the future. And oh I, yeah, I, that that was like my passion for mushrooms, adaptogens, optimal human performance is just within me. For me to put my focus on building a company, I had to see that something was about to change. And that was basically what we're doing now is like information sharing with blogs initially, and then social media and now podcasts enable information that was unpopular or odd to spread easily without use of external funding. So like my company is like, is not run on VC money, right? So you have to figure out like, how do you get your message out in a cost efficient way or ideally for free just by sharing what you do and doing good stuff, right? Mm-hmm. That was not possible, for example, when I discovered the fur mushroom 13 years ago. There was no way. You needed tons of dough or you needed to have um, like a small tweak to an existing belief. So now you have protein, but you have more protein, 13% <laughs> more protein. Or yeah. you had, you know, potato chips with 12% less fat or something yeah. like that. So you couldn't build, like if you come out and say, it's like, hey, I want to wake the whole world drink mushrooms, which basically I'm trying to do get the whole world drinking mushrooms 
it's 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 so out there it's so mm -hmm. right. insane is that like people are not gonna buy into that unless there's a way of how you can tell the story mm -hmm. at long form like we're doing now right mm -hmm. so that block 2.0 the web 2.0 whole that world was like okay that's that stuff there me believing in their ability to lower stress is more relevant now than ever the adaptogens help with like stress. We have more stress than ever. The ability to help with your cognitive function. We have more need for brain power than we've ever had. Or natural beauty industry is just blowing up and, and people are consuming these BS stuff all the time to look themselves pretty. And actually it's just hurting their skin quality when mm. there's like natural ways of actually mm. making it. So I saw that happening, but it really like, how can you do it without pouring millions of some bankers money into it? Right, yeah. right. And you, you guys, know. and you guys, I mean, early on, because podcasting now is, is getting popular. It's getting mainstream. But even yeah. three years ago when we started our show, it wasn't. I would go up to people and ask them, you know, uh, if they listen to podcasts and they'd say, well, what's a podcast? And that was just three, mm -hmm. three years ago. But you guys have been on podcasts or sponsoring or advertising on podcasts like pretty early on. Was it, what made you decide to go that route? Was it that you saw that, okay, new media is the way to go or? We just love education. Like my mother is a teacher. She taught physiology and anatomy. I just love education, you know? And I think a podcast is like a revolutionary way of educating people. And so you listen to them way before you even. Yeah. And it's, I think the magic of podcast is the, is the fact that you can do it in a car. I think, especially mm -hmm. for America, that's, that is mm -hmm. the jam. I would use them to audiobooks um, before that, and audiobooks are good, um, but I feel like podcasts are better. Oh yeah, way yeah. more interactive, and if you yeah, can learn at the same time. Yeah. But both of them have this magic of the stuff that if you go for a run or walk, if you're in a car, mm -hmm. if you're whatever, you can do it in the, as a background. And so that's why I love them. You know, And the second thing is that you know the curation process is completely different than let's say radio or TV or like there's a editor in a magazine telling sure. what is allowed to be told. And now there's a platform that like anybody can put out any content and if it's good content, somebody will consume mm -hmm. it. Right. So, you know, just super supportive of like odd people and different thinkers putting their word out. But as you guys know, is like in theory, making a podcast is free, right? In theory, right? You just need your phone or sure. whatever, but it actually takes a lot of time and money to put out there. So supporting that is actually like, it's almost better than supporting mm -hmm. a charity is like supporting education for free. And in, in Finland, I was happy enough to brought up for free educational system. So all universities and colleges and everything mm -hmm. is free and you actually get almost like a salary allowance to go to school. But here, it's that's not the case. Sure. So, podcast is one of the answers for a lot of. I think for a lot of people, for anybody wherever you live, you have access to free education. How, really how long? Mm -hmm. have, how long ago did you guys start? How long did the form Sigmatic start? Uh, six years ago, and three years now in the U.S. Was it? Was it? Where did you start then? Was it in, in Finland? I was living in Switzerland, and it was launched in Hong Kong, and then I moved to the Philippines. So it's like the craziest oh, life what? story. It's all over the place. Man. So, all over the place. Yeah. All Why over. did you go there? Philippines? No, or? Hong Kong. Uh, and then Philippines, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There was no really no taxes there. and Hong Kong is very business, <laughs> very business and friendly. Yeah. There was other downsides to it. But like when you had no money, you know, like you couldn't really, I couldn't pay myself a salary for the first two years. Yeah, tell, you know? tell the business yeah. story. I would uh, love to hear, you know, starting in with your own money like that. I find that fascinating. And where are you at now? Whatever you can And it's share. easier now, guys. Like it's getting easier. It's still, in certain ways, it's harder because like everybody's like flocking on Instagram ads and Facebook. Sure. Sure. Stubber, but still like in today's world it's certain infrastructural parts of it, running a business gets easier like accounting and fulfillment for physical products and all that stuff gets easier and easier but um yeah i mean starting starting a business with limited capital or no capital requires really that you have something else of value right because like you are not going to win anybody by outbidding them on ads or sponsorships mm -hmm. or hiring the top talent who can get you into GNC, Whole Foods, Walmart, Target, whatever. Like in my case, it was just like my knowledge and passion for whatever I do. So ability to source better than anyone else, but ability to formulate better than anyone else. Like, so another way to say, which is not true, but like that marketing is a tax you pay for a bad product. Mm -hmm. 
And if you just like believe, especially in today's world, that you have the best product, not just believe, but it actually is true, that is a way of entry. So if you're listening to this and you want to do something, is it a service business, a product business, whatever, because of internet, it's hard to be the fourth best product on the market in your category. It's really, really hard because why would anybody buy your product? Mm. You don't have to be- That's a good point. The best is- a white definition for some one person it might be best means the cheapest if you are always the cheapest product in your category there's there's a market for you right then you have the best product like who has the best quality. product yeah quality and then there's like the best customer experience so like you offer something else that others can offer um so you're fucked if you're the fourth company. You, I think you. That's <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm cheapest, probably some. I'm, I'm not a super business mind, so maybe some business guys there, there like <laughs> yeah. waving their fingers, like that is not how Tracy and Versa meant it in 1997 when they drew the value disciplines. <laughs> Fuck that. I think if I'm a consumer and I want no, headphones, I, think, I, think I want headphones. Point. Right. Like, I. Why would I buy your headphones? Like, do you want like, I want the amazing headphones. I want the, you know, the best overall experience. And right. overall experience can mean branding and design and all that kind of other stuff, customer service, like sh sabos with shoes and stuff like can mean a lot of stuff, but why would I buy your product? Like I if, think that a lot of that's dying. I, th I think we're in this, I mean, I know just in my time of shopping for something online has completely evolved and changed in the last 10 years. In the past, we would search for a brand that we recognize, but now you search and you look for what's got the five star, the reviews. five star yeah. reviews. Yeah. And Let's so. take like age old question, like which protein do you use? Like, right. Why would you use an average whey protein? Like why, like who, who would use that? Like, right. cause you kind of give a shit yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So either you choose a product that is like, especially in today's world, you choose the product you think is like absolute cleanest, best, whatever. Sure. Or the flavor is on point. So you're it's not going to throw up. one category. You have to like somehow, um, yeah, I think a lot of like me too products are just going to die out because of internet. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they just can. I can see that. Like, because even if you find them and they're sold, you're going to Google mm -hmm. them and say like, oh, actually this product is better. Like this has yeah. better reviews. Yeah, or yeah. this one, these guys are not as nearly as good as these guys, right? That's a good point. So you start in Hong Kong and you launch your product online? No, actually we launched it in, in Europe and uh, in Europe, the language difference is difficult. So we started making basically mushroom tea in Europe and sold it in retail and education and all that stuff, community was done online. But mm -hmm. the sales channel was still like conventional at that mm -hmm. point. Also because of language barriers were easier to sell to stores. And then like a few years in, we started getting requests from the US and I came here before we moved the business just to kind of like talk. And I interviewed like hundreds of people and it's just like, if you would do this and ask them questions before making the decision. And the decision was pretty clear is that if you come here, you're all in, you don't come here to half-ass. So if this is the NHL, the NBA, and you come from the Euro league, like you gotta be all in, yeah, sure. like this is not, this is like, it, there's so much competition here mm -hmm. and the best of the best from around the world are here. You gotta be full on. So move the business here and quickly realized a couple things. Um, one was the fact that like buyers of, of Whole Foods or whatever, I'm, I don't want to pick on Whole Foods, but like whatever store they were like, uh, nobody drinks mushrooms here. First of all, <laughs> so, yeah. so like, I'm not going to buy this. Barrier. I was yeah. like, uh, our first product cost it like 38 bucks. It's like, why would anybody buy this product? Plus we came from Europe. So we didn't make any health claims. So our competitors would say is like, you know, this does make your penis bigger. No, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but like, it was easier for them to sell with, with basically telling you like, this is, so we try yes. to like actually deep educate, like how does mushrooms think right. or whatever. And yeah, it was like a, quite a barrier of entry. Then second thing we realized that was like, people here don't drink tea. If they drink tea, they don't know what's the difference between good tea and bad tea. You can have airplane tea and you think, oh, it's tea, you know, yeah. it's like Lipton. But every person, even if you're not quality conscious at all, and you're Jim or Susan mm -hmm. in, you know, Kentucky, you've had a bad cup of coffee, well, yeah. right? Co Everyone, yeah, we're, we're coffee that's people. That's a over great here. point. Yeah, we're not Everyone has had a bad cup of coffee. That's right. Even if coffee you culture. think yeah, Folgers coffee. is the bomb, <laughs> you have had a bad cup of coffee. So yeah. you know that there is an importance and value 
to upgrade your coffee. Like you've had heartburn, you've had jitters. You know that there, if somebody can offer you a coffee without the jitters or the coffee without the heartburn, a lot of people would be like, got it. Secondly, the problem with anything health when you introduce a new thing is compliance. So, you, you know, you can have this great workout program, but then people quit after a week or something. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't really help you, right? So mushrooms are no different. Like if you don't consume them, they don't help you, mm-hmm. right? So ritual, like how do you repeat the habit is really hard. One of the built-in repeat mechanisms is coffee. Like people rarely forget to have their coffee. Mm. So if you can make a healthy coffee, the sapinly also has these immune and gut supporting mushrooms, but doesn't give you the jitters or whatever. People are like, I'll have that every day. So we had to like move from making mushroom tea into mushroom coffee. And instead of selling the mushroom thought, we're just like, hey, do you want coffee without the jitters? People are like, yeah, fuck yeah, just sign me up. <laughs> I'll, oh, I'll wow. try anything. And then second is like, because no buyers will want our product. We're like, okay, well, F this, we're just going to sell it online. And both of those ended up being like, I can't take credit for that, but like brilliant. Like they were ahead of the curve and then like podcast and like being online and, mm-hmm. you know, and we sell pretty well, for example, on Amazon. And like when we're there, like nobody really did that stuff on Amazon. So like you have like first mover advantage and stuff. Uh, How long did it take for the business to really start to take off? Um, it's a classic like overnight story that takes five years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, four or five years. Yeah, but like we were a uh, big shit within a certain community, so if like certain <laughs> big certain, shit small bowl. Yeah, <laughs> very small bowl. But like, uh, like we had we were on Vogue before we launched here or something like, or we had like celebrities using the products. I don't know even they, how they found it because it was not sold anywhere. So like, that's why I mean like with the marketing, the marketing is a tax for bad product. Like if you have, if you do something amazing, people, people will, will, will find, find it. it. Yeah, right. People will look for it and they'll talk about it. And mm-hmm. you don't have to make a viral video with an ad agency. Like if you just make good shit, you don't have to set yourself on fire and jump rope. <laughs> yeah, no, it can help though. We just like, very strategically. <laughs> no, we just spoke at a, a mastermind group, and then we were talking. That everyone was so surprised that we didn't have this huge marketing budget, and we hadn't spent a lot of money on that. And it was yeah. like, no, we, you know, we believed we had a good message, and there was a need for it in our space. And a hundred percent, the business has grown organic up until just now. I mean, we just yeah. hired a marketing team three, three, four months ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Like I said, I'm I'm the intermission after uh, after putting like Ben and Paul and like <laughs> you put stuff like that, like it will spread. Like people yeah. will share those episodes five years from now. Yeah, like That's people cool. are like, hey, have yeah. you heard mm-hmm. this? Because it's gonna live there and it's mm-hmm. it's accessible at any time. So. so are you? So you're headquartered now here in Southern yeah, California. Yeah, in LA, we're based in, but we have a fully distributed team. So at the same time, like when we did this, we had to figure out like how to reinvent everything because we wouldn't have access to the resources. So one of the things we decided is like, why do we need, um, why do we need an office? Like what's the point? Technically we have an office in LA, New York and Helsinki, but nobody ever goes to them. So a team can be anywhere and there's clear benefits to it. And it's not, it's not always easy, but like Mm. there are benefits of like, you can choose the time when you're most effective. Mm. Like are you a morning person or evening person, right? Mm. Um, You can also, I take a nap every day. Like that's important for me. Um, And then some people want to like, we can hire better talent because we don't have to relocate them. Or as a company, because people can live in a cheaper place. Like the first few years, because I couldn't pay myself, I, I would live in low cost countries around the world because like, I could have a good, solid quality of life, you know, drinking a coconut by the beach, but still only spend a few yeah. hundred bucks a month, you know? That's what was that the Philippines right there, right? Yeah, Philippines. <laughs> Philippines is one of those destinations. But um Are you are you married or are you single? Uh, I'm single, ready so, to mingle. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, hey. Yeah. Hey. So what's uh what, what's your favorite country so far? Because you've you've operated business in Europe, uh Hong, Hong Kong, Kong, Philippines yeah. here. Yeah, this they're, is my they're vastly different markets. Yeah, this is my tenth country I'm living in. Oh, really? Oh, wow. oh name the other ones: <laughs> uh, U.S., Canada, France, Italy, U.K., Switzerland, Australia. I think that's it. 
Finland, okay, Finland. Right. Good deal. Um, yeah, I stopped picking favorites when I was like a teenager, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, they're all good in different ways. I, th I think actually that's kind of you set yourself up for failure is, is expectations. Like somebody said that happiness is like when reality meets expectations and you have two controls, two levers, you can control the reality and you can control the expectations. Mm. And with those two levers, you can control your happiness, right? Mm -hmm. So if I go to the Philippines and I expect the infrastructure to work and people to be on time, I could be pretty unhappy. If mm -hmm. I live in Switzerland and I'm there like, I paid $8 for a bottle of water, you know, I'm pretty <laughs> bummed, right? Yeah. But then you can look at it, it's like, hey, the most incredible nature is available for me for free at any time. Mm. Within an hour, I'll be in Zermatt or Sasfe, or I'll be here climbing or like, sure. I'll, and it's free, like, or close to free. And then I have to overpay here or in the Philippines, like I had other things that you could access, like a massage was three bucks. So you could have a massage every day, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not really uh, break the bank. So like the same with living in LA or in California, you are literally exposed to some of the greatest nature on the planet earth, like California national parks, state parks, like gorgeous insane gorgeous, gorgeous. like people just don't yeah. appreciate them but then you have traffic and, and yeah, cost and, of living and like what we're doing now like yeah. the community and the people who are here like right after this i'm going to get lunch with my friend max who apparently you know as well oh look at here oh, so yeah, like, awesome. like if you guy. live in finland there's great people but it's harder there than it is yeah. here yeah, yeah, or yeah. you know it's like so Obviously, technology is bridging a lot of those gaps, but at the same time, like every place has its pros and cons. Now, what's the what's what's in store for the future of uh, of Four Sigmatic? I, I, it's it seems to be growing. Can we talk about these chocolates? Pretty, yeah. What did you oh, give yeah. us here, dude? Is that still on the wrap? Uh, mushroom chocolate, um, and uh, one of the things when you do, delicious do what you want to do is we give that out for free. So we donate free mushroom chocolates to people. So we don't sell those except for Valentine's day. We sell them. And these are different than the mushroom <laughs> chocolates that I had in, uh, in Hawaii with my girlfriend where I started seeing funny things. Yeah. This is, that one is these everyday are, magic. Yeah. What, you, what you had there was one, once a year magic. <laughs> <laughs> or something like Santa that. magic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So, uh, the future, like what are you guys, what are you, what are you going to be doing in the future? What's, what's, what's ahead? Um, well, I just hate the question like people ask like, where are you gonna grow? I, I often give this anecdote of like a push up. As a trainer, you're like, okay, let's do 10 reps. Why the fuck nobody ever says nine reps? <laughs> <laughs> or 11. It's gotta be even, I don't know. It's, it's like 10, like 12, technology. 15, yeah. okay. So now you're a trainer and you're looking at the person you're training and they're doing, let's do 10 reps. After the fourth rep, the form gets all shitty. Yeah. Now you have a risk of injury or- sure that you're working the wrong muscle or whatever, but you're like 10, it's gotta be fucking yeah. 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or stone. Yeah. what if you can do 52, mm -hmm. right? The muscle doesn't know the weight you're pushing and knows the resistance, right? And, mm -hmm. and the, there's, so same with business. Like why do they all these numbers? Like you have to do this, you have to do that. Yeah. So I, I consider like the form being a much bigger thing. It's like, what can you mm -hmm. do with good form? Mm -hmm. Like what is the level and, but you still have to challenge yourself beyond your capabilities. So to give that hormesis, that hormetic stressor, like, so mm -hmm. you grow, if you don't push yourself, you don't grow, but you can't push yourself too much, right? Mm -hmm. right. What's that sweet spot? The other thing I like to say is like, everybody fucking says is like, wanna be like, we're us, not them. But like, I really try to live that. So every, every year I try to do something outlandish. Like I just, we just bought a school bus and that we name Mori and we're gonna convert it into a mushroom mobile that will travel around the country giving people free mushrooms. <laughs> we yeah, we right. opened a shroom what? room on Apakini, which is one of the trendiest streets in America. It's in Venice Beach with all these gentrified, like all these crazy fashion stores coming up. We opened a little shroom room on the corner that gives free mushrooms to people. And it's so rad. And just we just, you just, it just it we are, I make a mushroom academy that like, Every online marketer would have said we should have charged people to do that. It's for free online. So you can go to a free Mushroom Academy e-learning course and just making like dope products, like uh, trying to figure out in different ways how you can sneak people like mushrooms, adaptogens and other like top superfoods to their diet without them really noticing. Like that's mm. the, that's the kind of like the ultimate ninja move is, is when you can like incorporate to your like your mom and dad's life, a mushroom coffee or something else that we're working on right now that like you can just 
put it into your body and you're not gonna you're like oh that was good that's a dope attitude yeah, yeah. yeah. are you living your dream yeah I'm, sounds like it yeah i mean that's also like uh it's funny it's like are you living your dream like what does that actually like i actually mean that's i always like meditate <laughs> on that <laughs> what the fuck yeah. is that yeah. mean? <laughs> i'm having fun most of the time yeah, yeah. yeah most of the time that's cool man. well shit excellent yeah. man you definitely live your brand i mean i'm glad we yeah for sure yeah we work with you guys yeah Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.